Call the meeting to order, please. <clears throat> This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, July 16th, 2020. The time is 7 p.m. Please call the roll. President Sell. Here. Trustee Gallagher. Here. Trustee Giza. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. If you'll join us for the pledge. Thank you. If you'll, if you'll give me a, a forbearance here, I, I can't have this on and see you at the same time. <laughs> Every time I breathe out, I fog up. Um, just before we get started, a couple things. This room, especially when the air conditioner is running, it's very difficult to hear one another. So uh, please speak up if you're here for public comment. You're welcome to just speak from right where you are if you just want to do that or you can go up to the podium with the microphone. Uh, we are implementing a, a, an additional level of safety procedure tonight because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, firefighter Johanna Mungia is going to be up here and she's going to be sanitizing the podium and the microphone after each speaker. So uh, once you speak and go back, if the next speaker could just give her a moment to get the podium and the microphone ready for you. But like I say, you're welcome to, to speak from right where you are if you prefer to do that. Um, I'm going to make one small change in the agenda uh, just so we can get our new trustee up here with us. Uh, as you all know, uh, Elizabeth Peters uh, you know, resigned because she uh, moved out of state with her family. And I asked uh, former trustee uh, Pat Collins if she would be willing to serve out the term uh, of Ms. Peters, and she very graciously accepted. So uh, I would like to ask for uh, a motion and a second to appoint Trustee Collins. So moved. By Mr. Galagos. A second. By Mr. Gisa. Any discussion? Do we need a roll call on this, Lance? Or? We do. OK, call the roll, please. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Welcome, Ms. Collins, if you'd like to. <laughs> I, I, I told you it might be a close vote, but <laughs> yes, if you can join us now. Thank you. Yes. And we're all very lucky to have Ms. Collins back with us. So we'll move on now to presentations and public comment. Uh, if you are here for public comment, you're welcome to give your comments during the period for co public comment at the start of the, of the agenda, or you can wait till a particular item on the agenda if that's what you want to address. Um, if you do go up to the podium, we ask that you just give your name and your street address. <clears throat> but first up this evening, we have uh, two presentations. We're honored to have with us tonight Eric Wagner from Visit Oak Park, and he's going to tell us a little bit about our partnership with Visit Oak Park and the wonderful thing that they're doing for us. Mr. Wagner. Good evening, Village President and Honorable Trustees. My name is Eric Wagner. I am the President and CEO of Visit Oak Park. Um, Visit Oak Park, is the Tourism Bureau that represents pretty much all of Western Cook County. I'd like to start with this um, quote from the man who created Pure Michigan, talking about the role that, that tourism plays in economic development. George, his name is George Zimmerman, and um, he said, tourism is indeed the first aid for economic development. Tourism as economic development um, happens when people get inspired to visit a community. When people get inspired to visit a community, they visit, they fall in love, they come back. Eventually they move there, they open up a business, they retire. Tourism can really play an important role in economic development, and it is sort of the first date of that process. A Little bit about Visit Oak Park. We are the state certified convention and visitor bureau. 
that essentially means that we are um, entitled to receive state funding to help market this area. We are a local affiliate of the Illinois Office of Tourism. There are currently 40 convention and visitor bureaus across Illinois. We receive state and local funding. Our, for, for, our funding formula comes from the Village of Oak Park, their hotel tax, and hotel, and hotel funds from the state of Illinois. Our partnership, we work very closely with the Illinois Office of Tourism on a number of domestic and international advertising campaigns. We work to make sure that this area is represented on Enjoy Illinois, in Enjoy Illinois Magazine, which I, which I gave you a copy of. And we work with the state of Illinois um, to promote this area in different marketing initiatives, such as Illinois Made, which we've been really happy to have a number of Illinois Made makers from this area, including Quincy Street Distillery, um, Higgins Glass, and Fleur. We have 19 partner communities. Um, and we're growing. We actually got two new communities this year. We're pleased to welcome back Berwyn, and we're pleased to add LaGrange to our, um, to our fold. So what does it mean when the partnership between Visit Oak Park and the Village of Riverside? So this is a no-cost par partnership opportunity for Riverside, but it does give a lot of benefits from both the Illinois Office of Tourism and from, Villa and from Visit Oak Park. As with regard to the Illinois Office of Tourism, it gets the village placed on the enjoyillinois.com website, in Enjoy Illinois Magazine, and in different marketing and advertising initiatives. Similarly for Visit Oak Park as well, on our website, in our inspiration guide, which I gave you copies of, and in our advertising and marketing campaigns. It also enables you, the village, to um, to tap into our different services that we offer. So we offer a number of what we call destination marketing services. Um, the most, the, one of the most important ones are the ones that a lot of our partner communities really particularly enjoy is our marketing partnership opportunities. So, you know, we've entered into a number of different marketing campaigns with our different partner communities in order to pool our money together to have it go farther. I want to promote Riverside as much as Riverside does, so how do we put our marketing dollars together to have them go farther? So we're pleased to offer a number of um, marketing partnership opportunities that enable us both to get um, what we're looking for, which is to help promote Riverside and the Oak Park area in general. Since I joined um, Visit Oak Park, we have done a number of things to help um, take Visit Oak Park to the next level. We've been focused heavily on meeting the demands of today's consumers, so we went ahead and developed a new visual brand identity. We created a new um, brand called Meet Us Here, which allows us to incorporate a number of our partner communities in that branding. So Meet Us Here could be Meet Us in Oak Park, Meet Us in Riverside, Meet Us at Brookfield Zoo. We really wanted to develop a dynamic brand that would help us incorporate our other communities since our name is Visit Oak Park, but we also represent a number of other communities. We invested in a new website, we uh, created a new brand video, we invested uh, in heavily in video and photography. We created a new inspiration guide which had a whole new strategy, so instead of just having the traditional visitor guide that just sits at the rest stops in, uh, you know, on 290 or whatever, we went ahead and um, worked with um, Midwest Living or Meredith the Publisher to create um, an inspiration guide that gets polybagged in all of their magazines and goes and targets directly um, their Midwest travel enthusiasts. So it was a whole new strategy we did with the Inspiration Guide. We also invested heavily in focusing on digital marketing. Digital marketing isn't just the future, digital marketing is now. And so we made sure that Visit Oak Park was set up to do really highly sophisticated digital marketing to really make sure that we're maximizing our dollars in the marketplace. And then we also shifted from a traditional chamber model, which um, has membership, to this new marketing partnership um, model that allows us to enter into different marketing partnerships with our partner communities and our area attractions. This slide just shows you a little bit of um, some of the things I was talking about earlier. You can see our new branding, how we've been able to incorporate, for, in this case, Brookfield, um, into our branding. You see our new tagline, Meet Us Here. That's Frank Lloyd Wright in the background, a new inspiration guide, and just our new video and, and some of our other assets that we've created. I want to talk a little bit about the Visit Oak Park Riverside Partnership that we just completed. 
So we worked with the village to create a new um, Riverside community page on our website. Visit riversideil.com. We executed a digital marketing campaign for Riverside this past fall winter called Meet Us in Riverside. We created a number of new Riverside assets, um, in, particularly, in particular a number of new videos. We created a, um, a new brand video just for Riverside. And then we also um, created a video for Fleur for Illinois Made. Um, and we worked with the state of Illinois to make sure that they went ahead and created a video for Higgins Glass. And then we went ahead and did a number of photo shoots to help get some new assets to really highlight the village. And you see all of the photos are, in, are on the presentation. <coughs> Not all of them, but a number of them. I want to quickly walk you through the new Riverside community page, which serves as basically a, a new website for Riverside. It launched on Friday, November 22nd. Basically helps serve as a, as a, a website for Riverside with its own URL, visit riversideil.com. You get your own community logo and images. Um, we provide a number of itineraries and stories that help highlight Riverside. Uh, we're going to be adding a, an event section and business listings, and we also have a collage of social media photos at the end, um, at, at the bottom of the page. And then we also have uh, a number of technical things that are important to making sure you have an effective website, such as SEO and um, Google Analytics. We launched a campaign, as I said um, earlier this past fall, ran from um, November and December. We targeted a 25 mile radius outside Chicagoland. We primarily, for cost effective reasons, focused on Facebook and Instagram. We ran the campaign out of our Facebook account, but we used um, Riverside's branding and logo. Um, and the result was we got about 164,000 impressions. These were the videos I wanted to show you that we produced. Unfortunately, they didn't download correctly, but we produced, we worked with the Illinois Office of Tourism to create um, a video for Fleur that I wanted to show that I can't show, unfortunately, unless it, and then we also created a new um, video, a brand video highlighting, um, highlighting Riverside as a community that I, unfortunately I can't show right now either, but I'll get, make sure you get copies of those. And then again, just focusing on the new photography that we did of the village to try to focus on the key drivers that get people to come to the village. So I'll quickly talk about next steps. Um, so we're recommending for the village's investment that we continue building out the community page. Content is king, and so we just want to make sure that we're focused on adding more stories and more itineraries that get people inspired to come and visit Riverside. Um, we want to make sure we're getting all of our new photos and videos up on the uh, new community page. We want to add um, local events when they come back. We'll get all the business listings up there, and we'll just make sure it's optimized um, for search engine. And the goal for us is really to make sure that we own all search results for Riverside and that we're collecting data and then able to retarget um, using that data people who show interest in what Riverside has to offer. I just want to say thank you to Riverside. I did this really quick because I know you have a time constraint. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Riverside for your partnership over the years. We have really valued having Riverside as one of our partner communities. Riverside really does have a lot to offer. And we're really pleased that we can partner with you because this really is one of those communities that we have that um, generates a lot of interest um, in visitors, whether they're from the Chicago area or from out, out of state. I just want to thank, you know, Riverside has had a great partnership with Visit Oak Park. Um, our board chair is Aberdeen Marsh, Marsh Oska, who um, leads us, um, leads the organization. And so we thank her for all of her time and dedication. And we also thank Jennifer Fournier, who's been a new addition to our board, who has really helped take the organization to a new level, in particular with our digital marketing. The current pandemic has had an impact. We're funded by hotel taxes, so it has had an impact on our funding. But um, you know, at this point, we're waiting for funding to return. We do have a commitment from Governor Pritzker and from the legislature to continue our funding for FY21. Um, and we know now more than ever that um, you know, partnership is going to be key as we all try to get through the recovery. 
So we're really looking forward to partnering with the, um, the village to help Riverside and all of Western Cook County recover from the current economic downturn. I did that really fast, but if there's any questions, I'm willing to take any you might have. Trustees or anyone visiting with us tonight? Mr. Wagner, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Village Riverside. This has been a very lucrative and, and rewarding partnership that we have with Visit Oak Park. Aberdeen and, and Jennifer, thank you for being our point people there. And we look forward to a long and prosperous relationship with you. Thank you so much. Now, we're really excited to continue the partnership. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. So next up, we have a fun presentation for us tonight. We have our very own village forester, Mike Collins is here. And I'm not even gonna spoil what, how cool this is. I'm just gonna let him, let him start and you'll see what Mike has been up to. Mr. Collins. Good evening, President Sells, village trustees and village manager Francis. Uh, you know, to say these past months have been challenging would be an understatement, so I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak about my trip to Shanghai, China last year with the Morton Arboretum. Um, I also would like to provide a very brief forestry update at the end. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to kind of hit the ground running and hopefully we'll have some time for discussion at the end if you have questions and such. So, Forester in a Foreign Land, uh, you can see the subtitle there. Uh, basically, the trip took place November 11th to the 17th in 2019. I was originally contacted by Cheshun Kwa, who is the urban tree science leader at the Morton Arboretum, uh, part of their research department. Uh, she basically extended an invitation to travel to Shanghai, China, and represent Riverside's municipal forestry program, which I was incredibly honored and humbled to do, uh, and really I share all of that with uh, everyone here in this room because really without the resources uh, to have a successful forestry program, I would not be there. Uh, anyway, they have a memorandum of understanding between the Shanghai Botanic Garden and Morton uh, where they agreed to do exchange programming and exchange activity. So, uh, you know, of course I ran this up the flagpole with Director Bailey. Uh, he spoke with all of you and once the, the uh, trip was somewhat green-lighted, uh, I was then uh, contacted by the Shanghai Engineering Research Center of Urban Tree Ecology and Application. Uh, you can see in the picture there my hosts. Uh, to the left there is Yan Ruqing. He was their municipal forester and uh, he basically oversees all 10 districts in Shanghai. No small task to say the least. Uh, in the center there is Yan Wei. She is the director of the research center. And then far right was Hillary, who was basically my translator and kind of uh, dragged me through the culture and helped me assimilate for the week. Um, so as part of the exchange activity, essentially every day we would go on these tours where they would take us to public parks and street areas. We would talk about urban tree challenges that they were facing. Uh, they were very interested in our support and, and insight related to American forestry. So we would have these meetings and discuss these challenges uh, I also committed to an hour-long presentation at a conference halfway through the trip, which was great. It pretty much presented our forestry program overseas. And then lastly, I did submit a, port, a report following uh, the trip, which I'd be happy to share with all of you if you're interested. Uh, you know, this would be a typical picture of street trees in old Shanghai. Uh, you note there, it might be a little difficult to see, but a majority of these trees are all the same, which are London plane trees very similar to our sycamore trees. They have over 1.2 million trees, 28 million people, which is almost hard to fathom coming from 10 million in the Chicagoland region. Uh, but uh, one thing I, I thought was really interesting is the fact that they had these monocultures, 70% London plane tree throughout the entire town, city. Uh, so, you know, that's a little concerning from the American perspective, but they really value these trees uh, and it really works for them, so just a, a cultural difference, really. Uh, but they did also apply in some locations some species diversity. Uh, you know, you can kind of see in this picture where 
They have some taxodium there, some smaller oaks coming in, a uh, little bit of ginkgo. Uh, you know, this was in a newer development on a boulevard across from our hotel. Uh, you know, their tree preservation, I think, is what really struck me the most. They uh, spent so much time and effort trying to hold on to their old trees. Uh, this particular tree, it's pretty fun. Uh, it started to lean and was about to fall over, so Chinese solution. Let's build this sculpture rock and we'll attach it with this rubber string and just leave it sitting so that it's propped up and it can keep you know, growing. Uh, this one was a probably 25 to 30 inch diameter London plane tree where they had basically topped it out. It had fallen over in a typhoon. Unfortunately, the picture doesn't come through that well, but there's rubber strapping on these two neighboring trees where they run guy wires over to support the tree. You can see they basically replanted it and propped it up and now it's starting to sprout again. This is a lot why they call these the super trees of Shanghai, the London plane trees, because it seemed like they could do almost anything. And then this was my personal favorite where they had a London plane tree that had split down the center, so they basically crafted a concrete pylon, painted it the color of the bark, and then affixed it with a toe strap at the top. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty amazing stuff, really, very inspiring. In terms of their tree pruning, I was completely overwhelmed by the amount of labor that they put towards their work over there. Um, you know, they basically have crews come in and, and prune every tree once a year, all 1.2 million. Uh, the one thing I really found interesting is they do this crazy pruning approach to me as an American forester where they basically top the tree and they'll make it grow into a cup formation which then goes around these power lines. This is to avoid that infrastructure conflict. Uh, very different from what we would do here, but it, again, it works for them. Um, in terms of their tree planting, I was completely blown away. This is probably mm -hmm. a 10 to 12 inch diameter tree that they basically pruned all of, all of the growth off of it, planted it, and it will re-sprout around these power lines. That's basically how they plant their trees. Uh, typically, we go for about a two-inch caliper tree, so everything's sort of supersized over there, which you know was kind of amazing. And then I caught this truck going by. It's a little blurry, but you can see the size of these trees. It was just you know very, very impressive. Uh, you know, I did want to share with you one of the favorite spots that I went on tours. It was the Zubayachi Gardens. It's one of five ancient gardens, 2,000 years old. Uh, basically, the original Chinese calligrapher lived there. Uh, and it was much more what I kind of pictured of China before I went there. You know, a very traditional, pristine, manicured garden. Uh, very beautiful. And then I had to share this picture in the garden. Hopefully you can see this. There's a little arrow at the top. There's this gondola, and you can see this crane sculpture. And then off in the distance, you see a construction crane all in one eye shot. And I just thought that was kind of hilarious. You know, it's like old world China meets new world China, um, you know, in the way that Shanghai is developing so quickly and things are being built up so fast. It was just kind of a neat thing to see in one eye shot. Uh, and then also I wanted to share a picture of this 300-year-old camphor tree, which was in the courtyard. Just reminded me of home in the way of, you know, all of the massive oaks that we have here. It was just really breathtaking. Um, and then uh, Fusing Park. Uh, this was a French park that I had went to, um, you know, uh, built in 1908, more in the city center. You can see the skyscrapers off in the distance. Uh, one thing that really impressed me was the amount of community in their public spaces. You see pictures here of people dancing together. Um, you know, there are people playing chess and checkers and, and, you know, wooden sword fights, everything you could think of, hanging bir their birds in trees and cages. I mean, it was really a gathering every day that you would see. Um, and it kind of reminded me a lot of Riverside. It was almost like Olmsted's vision realized halfway across, across the globe. Uh, which I thought was really inspiring. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I just wanted to kind of give props in the way of their hardscape. I mean, you know, you see all these pebbles. Each one of these pebbles were concreted uh, into a pathway, and just the amount of labor something like that takes, you know, really their attention to detail, I was just incredibly impressed. Um, so, uh, you know, really that, that 
trip for me, I think, expanded me both professionally and personally, and I just wanted to share that, and I really appreciate the invitation uh, to talk about that tonight. And then I did want to, of course, take advantage and give you a slight forestry update. Um, just wanted to let you know, you know, 2017, 2018, we did receive a cost match grant. We're awarded that grant and implemented that grant. Uh, we redid our entire street tree inventory and parks as well. Uh, as a result, we did uh, generate a management plan that goes out to 2023, uh, you know, giving some recommendations and a few modifications based on uh, some insights uh, and data that was acquired. Uh, tree planting, we did about 65 trees this year. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I thank the Frederick Law Olmsted Society for their kind and generous donation. They donated $2,000 uh, for park planting this year. Uh, removals wise, we're actually doing fairly well this year. We've only removed 35 trees to date. I do believe that climate change is driving a lot of these, especially uh, probably 40 or 50 percent of the trees I've been removing are maples, which are forecasted to no longer be in the Chicagoland region by 2050, which is concerning. Uh, emerald ash borer and Dutch elm disease have been fairly moderate. I'm going to knock on wood on that. Hopefully I'm not jinxing anything there, but we have not had many major outbreaks at this point, and emerald ash borer is really on the back end. Uh, cyclic trimming, we did uh, division, we will be doing division two this year, uh, which would be Lawton, Gage, Olmstead, Blackhawk. Uh, just also wanted to let you know, since I was here last, I did receive my municipal specialist accreditation, which is just a higher level uh, of a certified arborist through the International Society of Arboriculture. Also uh, received a tree risk assessment qualification as well for appraising risk. And then 15 years of Tree City USA and moving onward, which is really just a recommend, uh, recognition by the National Arbor Day Foundation as to how much we put towards our urban canopy here in Riverside and what we do. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to close and let you know about our Worth Project, which is the White Oak Riverside Tree Heritage Project. Um, in 2017, I went around the river and collected uh, acorns from our pre-settlement white oak trees. We've engaged with Possibility Place for contractual growing where we'll grow these trees on by 2023 uh, at the latest, about 102 inch saplings. And I think the idea behind this is to preserve a genetic uh, legacy in terms of our pre-settlement oaks around the river uh, and try to start under planting in advance of those losses. So with that, uh, I, again, I just wanted to thank you for your time. And uh, if you had any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Questions for Forrester Collins? Anyone in the audience? I, I did. What, it, what is the effect of climate change on the maples? What is it? What is it that's happening to the maples? Well, in essence, you know, with climate change, it's the extreme weather events, whether it's extreme drought or extreme moisture. And in the case of maples, for instance, uh, you know, these, like for instance, in May we had about nine inches of rainfall, which pretty much leaves maple sitting in a completely saturated soil. Uh, you know, most people think, oh, trees are getting water, they're happy. Well, uh, you know, maples are a fairly sensitive species, and for their feeder roots to be underwater for a month at a time, they generally start to die back. Uh, and then, you know, as a consequence, you start to see the top portion of the tree trying to balance out and begin to die back as well. Uh, and then also further exacerbated why, when we have, you know, like the drought that we had in 2014, for instance, that has another severe impact on maple tree roots. So it's almost like a one-two punch of extreme drought and excessive flooding that then tips the scale and starts to put them into decline. On the maple trees, so like I have one in my backyard where the roots are actually coming up out of the ground. What can residents do? Are we supposed to cover that up, or should we leave the roots growing up? Um, I, I caught some of that. You said that it was Sorry. underground? No, the roots are coming up out of the ground. They're just oh. like, they're like, you know, parallel with the ground. How should residents treat that? Because it seems like they're coming up more and more recently. It's only about a 20-foot tree, but I'm trying to take care of it. Generally, what I would recommend is to maybe protect those roots with a, a layer of mulch to keep mowers off of them and such. But, you know, I think generally some surface rooting is acceptable up to a certain point. Uh, we really want trees to root 
a little deeper than that, but you know, it's really hard to turn back the clock of time on those sorts of issues. So I would just recommend mulching, protect the tree roots. Well, Mr. Collins, I, I just would like to say that I, I can't imagine a better steward for our urban forest or for Olmsted's vision than you. And uh, we're really honored that you were able to go to China and represent not only Riverside, but our nation. So thank you for the extraordinary work you do for us and for sharing some of it with them. Thank you so much. I, I, again, I couldn't do it without the support that I get from the board, village manager, and Director Bailey. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Wagner, you're free to escape if you want to. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> Next up is public comment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're welcome to speak now, uh, or you can wait until we get to a specific agenda item. Would anyone like to address the board at this point? Okay, we'll move on then to reports of village officers. First up is the president's report. <clears throat> you have before you a motion to appoint and reappoint the following individuals to various village boards and commissions. Appoint Charles Terhune to the Economic Development Commission, a term to expire 2021. Appoint Larry Forsberg to the Economic Development Commission, term to expire 2023. Appoint John McLennan to the Parks and Recreation Board, term to expire 2025. Reappoint Richard Julian to the Historical Commission, term to expire 2023. Reappoint Sandra Kaplan to the Preservation Commission, term to expire 2023. And reappoint Sean O'Brien to the Parks and Recreation Board, term to expire 2025. I'd ask for a motion and second to appoint. So moved. By Mr. Galagos. Second. By Mr. Hannon. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Trustee, Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries, and we're fortunate to have Mr. McClendon here with us this evening uh, to be sworn in. If you'd like to step up and Ms. Haley can do it for you. Is Mr. McClendon here? You're Mr. McClendon, right? Yeah. If you'll just walk over and, and Kathy will swear you in. I'm sorry, Charles, I didn't see you there. Thank you, John. Welcome. Are you ready for Mr. Terhune? Charles?
And no, just because you're now in the commission, you're not obligated to sit through the entire meeting. So you're welcome to stay, but you can feel free whenever, to leave whenever you wish. <laughs> okay. uh, next up is a motion that refers to, we've received a grant from the Regional Transportation Association to do a, an update on our zoning code with regard to our business districts. Uh, and as part of that process, we're creating an ad hoc committee that's gonna serve as, as a steering committee for that zoning update. So with regard to that, I have, I'd like a motion and a second to, to appoint the following individuals to the ad hoc committee, uh, Jeff Cermak, Jill Mateo, Jennifer Hanahan, and Doug Pollock. Yes, sir. Just a point of order, could we have the motion to create the committee and then the motion to appoint? Okay. I'd like the motion to create the ad hoc committee. So moved by Mr. Gallagos. Second. And Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, and now uh, to appoint the committee members. A motion and a second, please. So moved. Motion by Ms. Collins. So seconded. Second by Ms. <clears throat> Mr. Gallagos. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> So I have a few other incidental items that uh, I wanted to discuss tonight. Uh, the first it concerns the uh, chalk events that we've had in town the last uh, few weeks. I've received a number of questions about why those events were authorized or whether they were authorized. Uh, as part of that learning process, our village attorneys have, notif have explained to us, explained to me, I should say, uh, the notion of a public forum, but this is not a conversation that we've been able to have generally as a board. Uh, so I thought we would discuss that tonight. So with that, I'm gonna ask Mr. Molina if he can explain the concept of a public forum. Attorney Molina. Thank you. So the basically government property is divided into, into categories and what is a traditional public forum are those areas that have, are open in general to every member of the public. And those are things like sidewalks, typically not all sidewalks. There are some cases pointing out that although a sidewalk may be in the technically right of way, it's in such an obscure area that it may not be a traditional public forum or the streets and so forth of a municipality. And those are the areas that have traditionally been used by uh, members of the public to propose messages, whether those are political messages or religious messages, uh, but the basic communication to get a message out to all who will pay attention. The government's ability to regulate in a traditional public forum is, is at its most limited. Uh, it, first of all, it can't be content-based, but it almost can never be anyway in whatever forum there is. Uh, but the, it, it's very limited even in time, place, and manner restrictions, which are the typical way that what governments is, what, what, regulate. You, you said contact-based? So no, content. Oh, content. Content uh, can never be content-based. <clears throat> but in a traditional public forum, time, place, and manner restrictions are appropriate in some cases. For instance, uh, loud noises at 3 a.m. If you have someone who wants to protest at 3 a.m. and uses a loudspeaker or something, the government can regulate that. Uh, that's, a, that's a time, place, and manner type restriction. So typically on, on a public sidewalk during business hours, the government really has no ability uh, to control protesting unless it involves extraordinarily large numbers of people. And some municipalities have ordinances that deal with those large gatherings uh, and, and require advance notice for purposes of planning public safety and perhaps uh, directing traffic and so forth. Uh, many communities have these. Many of them are outdated because uh, they, they don't have objective criteria in them. Uh, and, and so they leave open the idea that someone who grants the permit, there, there are no standards and so they could deny it for any reason which then is pre creates a constitutional problem. Um, so specifically as it relates to chalk, 
There are a number of cases involving the ability of the government to regulate chalk, uh, not specifically, but through your typical ordinances which involve defacement of public property, which would include sidewalks and things like that, or damaging them. So the case is basically generally uphold such ordinances when they are challenged on their face by a plaintiff who says, look at this ordinance, this could be applied to chalk on a sidewalk. The cases typically uphold the ordinances as constitutional. However, the cases where someone has actually been charged with using chalk on a sidewalk tend to come out the other way. Uh, and the courts tend to say the chalk is temporary, it's harmless, it doesn't damage the sidewalk, and so it was not a reasonable uh, enforcement to, to cite the person or in some cases ar arrest them. So chalking in general, while a defacement ordinance is typically okay, whenever you're trying to enforce things like chalking on a sidewalk or something like that, it's probably not a good idea because it is temporary. And, you could point out that if the government wanted to forbid chalk on a sidewalk as, as defacement, you'd have to do the same for the kids that do the squares on the sidewalk, which are on just about every village street anyway. So as a practical matter, there would be a, a, a fairness issue there if you sort of pick and choose what chalking you don't like. So, uh, and then to go beyond a traditional public forum to uh, say the offices within Village Hall, the member of the public, just because it's government property, does not have a right to walk into Manager Francis's office and sit there and watch her do her job. That is not a traditional public forum. It's government property, but it's, it's, it's not open to the public, and so the government is free to bar the general public from, from from those areas unless there's some meeting or someone is invited. And then there's kind of a halfway house where a government can do a limited public forum. It can, uh, a good example of that is a meeting room or a room such as this where uh, government may create the ability for the public to use uh, a space that is public property and it, and, and, and it can do that in a limited way and it can even limit it to, to certain groups and not others, as long as the regulations are not content-based, but sort of classification-based. So you could, for instance, have a room that is open for meetings for residents only, or uh, a meet room that is open for meetings for any non-commercial reason, but you wouldn't allow, say, someone to uh, have rent the room or, or sign up to use the room to do a sales pitch, for example. And, and although that's discrimination on the basis of the kind of speech it is as far as a category, as long as those rules were reasonable um, and, and, and had, a, had a fair basis in what the government was trying to do, a court would likely uphold them. And that's a limited public forum. You're opening it, but not to the public at large. The way a traditional public forum is open to the public at large, and anybody can go there pretty much at any time as long as they're not disturbing the peace or violating some other criminal or, or, or valid local ordinance um, and, and, and make the kind of speech they want. So before I open it up to general questions from the trustees, this, this is a, re, a replay of a conversation I've already had with, with Mr. Molina. I, you know, the, our greatest concern when, when these events happened in the last couple of weeks has been public safety. Um, and the idea of having people out in the street you know, with traffic concerns. So how does, from, from, cause we have a duty to protect as well. So how does that balance work between our concern for public safety and keeping people safe during these kind of events and their right to do them. It, it, it works very difficult, <laughs> in, in a very difficult way. Uh, and, and the thing is because it's perception. So, so generally speaking, um, definitely a municipality has the right to tell people who are protesting to stay out of the street generally as far as blocking traffic. But if someone is in the street, remember people may be on a curb and they may want to be able to approach a car uh, to hold up a sign or something, and that is protected. 
so it's a delicate balance, and that's why I said some, some communities have these large, if you have large gatherings, they would have police that would prepare to cordon off a portion of a street, for example, if people wouldn't fit on the sidewalk. But in general, where the municipality has no knowledge of a protest or only anecdotal knowledge, now that we have social media, you see that there's a potential uh, if someone, someone happens to notice it. Uh, there's no obligation to close off streets or anything. The police would do their normal patrol throughout the area. If they noticed cars being blocked or something like that, they could you know, attempt to tell the people to get out of the way or uh, you know, perhaps direct traffic a little differently. We usually, under community policing standards and de-escalation, we try to make it so that the police are trying to not get involved in a situation where they're, they're, they're trying to tell people what to do as little as possible, especially when the protests involve the police themselves. It's just sort of a recipe for conflict that you, you just try to avoid or to at least minimize, and yet, as you said, President Sells, protect members of the public both the protesters, people in cars, other pedestrians, businesses whose means of ingress and egress may be being blocked uh, from others at a given time. Those are all things that are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, but again, always trying to achieve it through de as, as de-escalated a means as is reasonable. I mean, I mean we, were, we were fortunate in, in the last event because the, uh, the group, on their own initiative, decided to move it to Pine instead of being like on Long Common or Burlington. Right. So they, they shared our concern, our yeah. safety concerns. Yeah. So it was, it was a cooperative and effort. That's, so and that's a great that. thing when that, when that happens. The problem is sometimes the people who want to protest feel that those areas which are safest are not exposed enough. And that's the problem you run into. On the other hand, with social media, you know, it, sometimes it works out where, where, where it can be in an area that is immune from the fastest and the most dense traffic of vehicle traffic. So trustees, this is kind of the first time you're hearing all of this. Do you have any questions or discussion that you'd like to have among yourselves or with Mr. Molina? I do have a question. Uh, you said that some ordinances have been outdated. When was the last time that we have revised our ordinances? Yeah, so we, we had this, this discussion. The villages, uh, to the extent it has large gathering permit requirements, they're in a section called parade. Uh, it's a specific chapter. Uh, it would need some work in order to, and you know, to, to enforce it regularly. It has, a li it's it's a little bit outdated. It's not terrible, but okay. 1965 was when yeah. that that was promulgated. Okay. Could we perhaps take a look at that at the next meeting so we can we can put that see if we want to have it revised? Is that Mr. Hand? Yeah, trustee, so I'm sorry, I take this off yeah. to battle with the air conditioner. Yeah, and I'm if you sorry, I took mine off to just because I want people to be able to hear. Yeah. So, great. Well, you know, I just want to preface my comments. I know we have a lot of the um, people who put a couple of the uh, activities together, and just want to preface that I, I think it's spectacular what you guys are doing, raising awareness. Uh, I, I think the message is similar to the inclusiveness that we discussed, uh, uh, I think, last summer uh, when we were talking about the pride flag. So I, I just want to make sure that, you know, that's acknowledged because I think it's good that, um, you know, it, it's time for uh, relook at a lot of these issues. And I applaud you guys for taking the time and, and your organizational skills. Also, you apply, uh, applaud you guys for working with uh, the village to make sure that things are in advance, that, you know, there's not, um, you know, un undo um, safety issues created, and, and, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, Attorney Molina, I've got, you know, sort of a, a few questions and, and, and just trying to get some discussion here. Uh, you know, you mentioned temporary, and, and the analogy that I've used is, you know, somebody walking down with a sign. And for those of you who take the Union Pacific, you've seen the uh, guy with, um, the sign that simply says you're going to hell and has a megaphone and sits there and as you end your day. Um, what's the definition of temporary? Okay, well, so when I used the word temporary, I was talking about the, the chalk cases, right? Okay. So, the, the, so 
the, the courts that have dealt with people who have actually been subject to some enforcement mechanism by de using a defacement type ordinance have used the word temporary for the chalk as a way of saying it's not defacement because it will wash away. It's, it's not like spray paint, which will uh, get absorbed to some degree into the concrete, be very difficult. I mean, if you look at where there's been graffiti on, on bricks or on uh, cement, the, it, you can still see a shadow uh, unless the brick is really partially destroyed. And so the court was using the word temporary to say it's not really enough to be defacement or to be the equivalent of graffiti that's spray painted. But there is no, there is no definition. The court was using it in, in an opinionated way. The ordinance didn't say anything there about temporary or not. Okay, uh, and, and I guess I asked the question, you know, one thing you've noted, and I think all the trustees are aware, is that you know this is content neutral on on whatever uh, is so it can be a you know one of the local churches coming out with a anti-productive rights that they want to write on the sidewalk at some point or you know something wildly controversial that is is just offensive but not profane or does not incite violence and you know what I'd like to explore at some point is uh, you know is it a requirement that it needs to stay up for 24, 48, 40 hours, however you want to do it, or is there a policy that can be adopted to have it be, in fact, temporary speech, 48 hours, some degree where it's not immediately removed, but to put ourselves in a position that if we do have something, you know, more, you know, I don't even want to call this what they did controversial, but, you know, something that is going to um, you know, not be consistent with, I think, our community values that we would want removed, but obviously we can't remove it right away. I think there's a need for a policy in place on, you know, is it, you know, no less than 48 hours or something that adheres to that temporary messaging, but doesn't require the, vi the village and the residents to look at this, you know, again, not talking about what happened, talking about these hypotheticals in the future that are, um, you know, just inconsistent with the village values. Yeah, so there, there's no obligation for a municipality to leave chalk signage there after the protesters leave. Um, having said that, you don't want to remove it in a, in a way that is content-based. So for instance, you go out there if you don't like the message and you wash it right away, but the ones you don't care about, you leave. But if the, if the village has a policy to remove any chalk on any sidewalk, if it happens to be found, uh, that would be fine. It doesn't matter if it's five minutes after the protesters leave or 24 hours. And, and although I don't know of any chalk cases on that principle, there, there is a principle that is very well established that protesters who are protesting with signs, they can't like take a break and go home for two hours and have a right to leave their signs stuck in the ground. If they're there with the signs, that's fine. That's part of their message, but it's their message. This, they, they can't just leave the stuff there. And so the chalk, in a way, is kind of like that. It's left, uh, and, and because it's, the, it's right of way, it's village property, villages typically remove all signage from its right of way anyway, whether they're people trying to uh, sell palm readings or uh, you know, Craigslist ads or whatever. Uh, gar you know, even garage sales, they, if they're in the right of way and they and they aren't allowed, they're removed automatically, and no one has a right to have those things there. And, and then, just last question, I, I apologize for monopolizing the discussion. When it applies to the sidewalk, is 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 that the sidewalk itself? How do you distinguish between, you know, walls, retaining walls? I, I'm assuming it just means sort of the flat sidewalk area. Correct, because it is the traditional public forum. There's, there, there, there's no, the, the right to write on the side of a government building, whether it's in chalk or with anything else, is less. And, is, and in fact, the government can ban that. I was thinking more in terms of our Unless planters. it's a kiosk or something that's there for people to write on. Yeah, I was thinking more in the context of our planters and other sort of vertical, you know, landscaping we have around the village. I see. Um, 
I mean, I, I would think that would be a reasonable limitation if people, you know, have the ability to chalk on the sidewalk that you can you can ha add an additional restriction that they're limited to that. Okay. Other questions from the trustee? I, I do. Please. Okay, thank you. I want to also uh, echo the sentiments that Trustee Hannon just expressed to the Black Lives Matter movement. We do hear you, and the community has showed just how proud they are of you. So please don't take this the wrong way. Because um, you had mentioned that the pro protests to traffic and stuff, the village is responsible for making sure that they have a safety serenity, like we had for the June 9th and June 19th events, where we had police vehicles, emergency vehicles, to make sure that there wasn't traffic that's going to run into people and to keep rioters away. I mean, does the village have an obligation for that? So I'm not sure I quite understood everything you said, Rusty Gallegos. Maybe you'll need to t take down your mask for just okay. a second because I was having so a heart. When we had the two protests last month, uh, the village had their vehicles blocking off streets, blocking off traffic so that the march could happen. Freedom of expression was protected. Does the village have an obligation to do that? No. I mean, not, not, not some kind of an affirmative obligation. The police officers, in order to protect if, yeah. if they think that's the best thing to do, they have the discretion to do that. I mean, in that case, it was my understanding that one of the earlier ones, they actually had a pretty good idea, although it didn't, there was no permit per se involved. The village knew it was, it was anticipating a large group, yeah. and so they, they just, you know, they, they just did whatever they thought was the most appropriate to make it work so that this group could process the way that was planned. So, so but there's no obligation. Okay, so what happens if a village cannot afford to have that protection? Because my understanding is that those two protests cost the village $30,000. So if protests were to continue, the village itself could be in financial right. so, hurt. So that, so that, that's a so lot of money. That, that's, that's another area of concern. Um, it's just very, very difficult when you try to pass those costs along, um, you know, but if there's a really large situation where you've got a lot of people and the ordinance was neutral enough, some, some costs probably could be passed along. But we, we're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of people that require a major police presence. Okay. But I think the question is, are we required to provide a police no. presence? Okay. So if, if we knew there was a march and we knew where it was going to be, we could choose not to block streets. Correct. To just let it occur. Correct. Okay. And the, but you'd still have, you'd still probably want police in the area. I understand. And if, and if there were enough people where they were blocking the streets, they would have to use their judgment right. as to whether to, to try to get the people off the street or to try to intervene and hold up cars for a bit to let them pass. I mean, sometimes things happen, accidents happen right. all the time, and you've got to temporarily block certain lanes so things can be moved. In this case, people could process, and then as soon as uh, it's finished, then you would open it up again. They would treat it like that, like an accident, like a sudden occurrence that they have to deal with. And police deal with those things all the time. Mm -hmm. Does anyone with us have any questions for our attorney? Okay, Mr. Melia, thank you for that. That was very helpful. <clears throat> so the last thing I have for you tonight uh, is an update. Uh, you'll, rec you'll recall that uh, Representative Zaleski was able to obtain $350,000 in capital funding for a, a pervious path in Swan Pond. After further study, it became obvious to us that a pervious path doesn't really make any sense in Swan Pond because of the immediate drainage that, that's there. Uh, we have now got an estimate on how much it will cost to put an exposed aggregate uh, walkway through Swan Pond, and it's $475,000. So uh, today, I wrote Mr. Zaleski asking him if it would be possible for us to, to repurpose the original $350,000 to this new project. Uh, we'll see if he's able to do that for us. If he is able to do it for us, that leaves us with a shortfall of $125,000. We have an opportunity uh, for grant funding through Cook County. However, we've been informed that that grant funding would be a 50-50 match. So you know, the most we would be able to get from Cook County would be the 62-5. So my question for you is, knowing that it would require 
a 50% match, uh, if we're able to repurpose the $350,000, would you like staff to continue its effort to receive the grant funding? I would, yes. Okay. Would, would the plan still be to widen the path to 10 feet? Uh, it wouldn't be 10, is Mr. Bailey still here? Uh, the current plan is eight feet. Oh, but beyond what it's at now? Yeah, it'd be wider have, than it okay. is now. So the same as what it would have been under the previous yes. surface? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Pollock? I'm not sure I hear, heard everything you said. Um, I'm certainly in favor of pursuing grant funding for the pass. Um, I'm a bit concerned if we have to take money out of the general fund now uh, to match, uh, given given the economic. You're going to have to speak up. <clears throat> I'm, I'm all in favor of pursuing grant funding uh, for the pathway. I would want to see some justification if we had to take money out of the general fund. Uh, for our matching portion of the grant, knowing uh, that our revenues are going to be way down this year and they could could get worse before the year's over. So that'd be my only concern. I mean, I hear that, uh, but the reality is um, the option would be to not do it. You know, we, we, I mean, we either, we either come up, I mean, we, it can either cost us 625 or it can cost us 475. <laughs> I mean, that's really our our option. Um, and like I say, you know, we we have yet to to see whether or not Mr. Zaleski is going to be able to move that funding for us. So uh, this is not something that's written stone. But we don't want staff spinning their wheels unless there is a consensus that this is something we want to move forward on. Because as we know, the asphalt path is already, you know, falling apart in certain 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 areas. So I see one shaking of the head. Yes, yep. yes sir. So President Sells, I, I think the, the river path is one of the highlights of the village. It brings people down to that area. And I think you know any, any grant funding we can get to make that area more usable, more survivable during the flood and make it a showcase of the village is uh, worthwhile to pursue. Thank you. Um, so my understanding after our conversation last month was that um, the aggr expo exposed aggregate wouldn't last as long. Again, it would just be another 10-year mm -hmm. fix. And then we d talked about exploring repurposing the funds for the Quincy parking lot. So let me take the, the, the last, the, the, the lifespan. And I wish Mr. Bailey was here. Oh, you, he is here. Yeah. Mr. Bailey, what is, what is the expected lifespan for exposed aggregate? Generally speaking, um, well, we have uh, have used several uh, surfaces in Riverside over the years. Asphalt is one of the most common. That has a 15-year planning life. Concrete, which would include exposed aggregate concrete, is 35 years. And um, pavers, brick pavers, is 50. And, and with regard to the second part, uh, we were when we had our last discussion. We, it was our we, we thought that we would be able to that the cost for Swan Pond would be less than three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So at that point, we were going to explore the possibility of whether we could split that funding, you know, part for Swan Pond and part for parking lot eight. Mm -hmm. Now that we know that the cost is actually four hundred and seventy-five, mm -hmm. we would need the full three fifty for the Swan Pond portion. And then we would have to find a way through the parking lot fund to address the, the permeable lot at Park mm -hmm. 8. Okay, so it looks like we have a uh, Can I ask yes. uh, add a question? Ed, on those statistics you just provided, does that take the flooding into consideration? Have those been prorated or? Sorry. Durability of the bricks? The, just any the, the 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 15 years, 35 years, etc. Is that for the for the for the pathway? Is that taking the flooding into consideration, or are I, those shortened because because of the? Yeah, I I can't imagine that it would be a wise move to put permeable pavers at all in the Swan Pond. I think the only real, real reasonable choices are asphalt, which we have experience with, 
or concrete, mm -hmm. exposed aggregate concrete, uh, any kind of permeable surface doesn't make sense there because of, uh, well, there's nothing to be gained. Right. Um, and theoretically, at least, permeable surfaces require maintenance, except that there's you know, really no, no benefit from that. So I think the real, there's only two realistic choices there as far as uh, long-term durable surfaces, asphalt or concrete. Yeah, I mean, I think that, to me, that pathway is the highlight of the village for a lot of different reasons. I mean, I look at it from my house, so that's nice. But, but um, just for everyone else, I see people walking down that nonstop. And it's, it's not just for residents. I see people walking over the bridge coming or walking down it as well. Mm. Once in a while, I see some birders. <laughs> I can't imagine who that might be. <laughs> OK, so uh, we have consensus that we will Thank you, Mr. Bailey, that we will pursue the grant funding if it becomes feasible. Uh, so that's all I have. Manager Francis. I have only one item this evening. Um, I just wanted to update the board. You may recall the, sure. You may recall that we had the ad hoc uh, committee that was regarding uh, garages and driveways. You're going to have to pull the mask down. I, I can barely hear you. Okay. Um, so you may recall that we had the ad hoc committee on garages and driveways. Um, they actually had their final meeting on February 5th, 2020. Director Bailey, prior to their um, final meeting, had provided the board an update as to um, the findings of the group. Given that the completion of the ad hoc group has occurred, um, Director Bailey and Director Apt will work on the recommendations that were provided, and they will go through the process as it relates to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Preservation Commission. So this will be coming back to the Village Board at a future date. And that is all I have to report this evening. Thank you. We'll move on now to the approval of the consent agenda. On the agenda this evening is to ratify the voucher list of bills for July 2, approve the voucher list of bills for July 16, approve the Village Board of Trustee regular meeting minutes for June 18, these are all 2020, review and file the Economic Development Commission meeting minutes May 14, the Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting and public hearing of May 27, the Preservation Commission regular meeting minutes of February 13, and the special meeting minutes of February 25th, Review and file the Community Development, Finance, Fire, Police, and Public Work Department's monthly reports for June 2020. A resolution approving a change order for a fire suppression system and proposal for alarm system for Fox Valley Fire and Safety for an amount not to exceed $27,519. A resolution authorizing the sale or disposal of personal property owned by the Village of Riverside. A resolution to approve an amendment to the Village of Riverside Flexible Benefit Plan pursuant to the CARES Act. Motion to approve an intergovernmental agreement and <clears throat> subrecipient agreement for the coronavirus relief funds between Cook County and the Village of Riverside, and a re resolution authorizing a hardscape permit application for the installation of important bird area signage at Swan Pond and Riverside Road. I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve. So moved by Mr. Gallows. Second by Mr. Second. Lisa. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Reports of departments, commissions, or trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Oh, uh, uh, I'll take advantage of that opportunity. That's, this, is, this is actually an announcement I don't think I have made. Uh, with the departure of, of Ms. Peters, uh, with her res resignation, uh, Trustee Evans will become the new liaison to the Economic Development Commission. So anything else other than that? Okay. <clears throat> Next up are ordinances and resolutions. We have an ordinance authorizing renewal of aggregation program for electrical load. Manager Francis. Um, we do have Sharon Derling here from NIMAC who has helped the village since we, I'm sorry, sorry. 
Um, we do have Sharon Derling here from NIMAC who has helped the village through this process a number of times previously. But within your board packet, there are the bid tabulations and there is also an alternate option. And when looking at it from my perspective, looking at um, the two suppliers that are offering the match for the ComEd program, um, MC Squared actually will provide the village 100% green energy and also provide a civic contribution for our potential green initiatives um, over the duration of our contract with them, which can be up to three years. Um, so that is an option, and I think that would remain consistent with the village's goal for green energy. However, there is also a bid tabulation along with um, on page 194 of your packet that includes the different bid options that were provided and also ComEd's current rate. You will note that obviously these rates are at a premium in comparison to ComEd, whereas the MC squared program would provide residents the ComEd rate while also providing them the green energy. Um, if, if I may, President Sells, can share and um, go up and present to the board the additional findings that perhaps I have overlooked? Um, well, let me ask, let me just take a look. I mean, it seems to me this is pretty straightforward. Does, do you need further discussion or do you, is it pretty clear what we want? Is that okay with you? <laughs> okay. All right, well, with that, um, I'd ask for someone to make a motion so re regarding, a sp what it, well, we have to make a choice. Okay. Do, uh, the staff recommendation is MC squared. With the civic contribution. With the civic contribution. So uh, do I hear a motion and a second to choose MC squared energy? MC squared is what I prefer. Yes. <laughs> by Mr. Galagos. Second. Second by Mr. Pollock. Further discussion? Thank you again, Mr. Erling, for uh, leading us through this again and uh, providing us these great opportunities. Oh, I do, I'm sorry. Um, one item that was not addressed, we need to know the duration. Is it a one year, two year, or three year? One year, two year, three year. What is your recommendation? Well, three years, you've locked it away and you won't see me again for three years, but um, that means your residents wouldn't be receiving notices annually and if they get notice fatigue this is a little bit smoother um, and there would be that 10,000 contribution annually each year so three years you know would be optimal would be great but your choice of course would you like to amend your motion to include a three-year term i like the three-year term i do okay. so i'll amend it officially Okay, call the roll, please. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Galgos. Aye. Trustee Jiza. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you again, and thanks for coming tonight. And we like seeing you. You can come back every year. <laughs> okay. So thank you. All right. Next up are considerations, and first up is a discussion of ice cream trucks. Uh, Manager Francis, did you want to introduce this or did you want me just to do it? You can do it. So uh, this is, I had heard from uh, several residents with, re regarding this. We did some research. We found that in 2004, for reasons that we can't really determine, uh, ice cream trucks were kind of carved out of the food truck vendor uh, ordinance and specifically excluded and not allowed. So uh, the question for tonight is, do we just want to leave that prohibition in place? Or are you willing to revisit this and have staff take a look at kind of the, the, the kind of ordinance we would need to properly regulate an ice cream truck, to allow ice cream trucks within Riverside? Now, I, I do have a question on that. Please. Uh, with the uh, pandemic happening right now, are there any guidelines for the CDC on, on this or, or a health department that, that I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to find anything specifically with with regard to ice cream trucks. Okay. Uh, I mean that when when you look, for example, Elgin had had outlaw, had had this outlawed for 45 years, and then last I think it was last year they changed the and allow them now. So those kind of health concerns could obviously be addressed within the ordinance uh, or within the permitting procedure for you know the trucks. But you know, I mean, obviously, we would take appropriate caution to protect okay. children and the occasional well, adult that wants to visit. Here's a scenario I remember growing up here. So uh, the swim club 
would have adult swims, two o'clock, three o'clock on the hour. All the kids had to get out of the pool, and the ice cream truck knew exactly when to come by with, with their times, and then 20, 30 kids would rush over there. You have that group of kids so closely together during the pandemic, uh, there could be a concern. So that's, that's the one I have right now. In general, I would be fine with them, but you know, I like to play it safe on this, on this matter. What's everybody else think? Mr. Hannon? Yeah, I've, I've got, in addition to the pandemic concern, um, you know, really, really twofold. I, I, as I read, and I'm not sure if this is out of our ordinance or, or what I'm looking at, where it's 3 1 12, um, it implies, um, you know, we have this special permit concept. And, and I like that concept simply because, number one, we don't want you know, ice cream trucks or any other sort of food truck coming in and taking business away from um, the businesses that we have in Riverside. Uh, if somebody wanted to open up an ice cream stand like we used to have, a sundry stand, um, I would hate to think that the fact that we have an ice cream truck come through every day would impair that from, from happening. You know, the second question I have is permitting, regulation, and, you know, any sort of tax collection. If we allow ice cream trucks to come through, how do we do that? How do we know who's permitted, who's not, who's paying their taxes to to the village? Um, you know, again, I agree with Trustee Gallagos. You know, now is not the time to allow it um, with the pandemic concerns. But if and when we do re revisit this, um, you know, I, I, I'd rather support the businesses that put down roots in this in the village. Uh, as opposed to encourage um, you know people driving through and see if they can make a few dollars off our residents. Are there comments? Um, yeah, I would be fine with the ice cream trucks driving through town. So the difference would be they don't need a permit. Wouldn't that be the difference in the ordinance? Well, the ordinances I've looked at are are actually pretty restrictive i mean the most most places charge between 100 to 150 dollars per truck for the mm -hmm. permit um they not only do they require background checks on the drivers um but they're pretty extensive background checks mm -hmm. i mean they go into sexual offender things and, and stuff like that that transcend what a normal food truck what might be because of the clientele obvious clientele of the of the ice cream trucks so there there are there's a lot of protection built in um, the, you know, one I, I think Mr. Mr. Hannon is right. One one thing that we would need to look carefully at is, I mean, I, I don't know how much revenue these things would actually generate, to mm -hmm. be honest. But um, that we would have to figure out some way that make sure that we capture the appropriate, you know, the appropriate revenue for the village. Right. But uh, yeah, the, the the ordinances I've looked at are very protective. So, um, yeah, I would be fine with ice cream trucks. I just, um, if we're going to take a look at the ordinance, we want to build in some sort of time limit for how long they can be on a street. Yeah, so they all, can't just all, park they, always, all. They, they, they usually have not only time limits, some have specific streets that they're not allowed on, you know, if there's like playgrounds or something like that. Uh, usually they're required that when they're actually doing their sales, they have to be, obviously they have to be stopped and the music has to stop. There are decibel restrictions so that, you know, the jingling isn't too loud. Mm -hmm. you know, so all of that, you know, people, this, we're not inventing the wheel here. I mean, you know, these, these ordinances are out there and uh, have, have been fine-tuned over the years. And I'm, I'm sure our attorneys are quite familiar with them anyway. Mr. Pollack. Thank you. I would be in favor of looking into this more. Um, I think by the time we got around to considering an ordinance, it'd be the end of the year, and this would be for next year. Um, anyway, so, uh, and there are a lot of issues to be addressed, as you mentioned, uh, uh, typical business regulations, sales tax, um, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, I would be in favor of pursuing this, considering it. Yeah, I think that's a realistic timeline. I don't foresee us being able to do this you know, for this summer. Um, so from a nostalgic perspective, yeah, it'd be fantastic to have the good humor truck come back through. <laughs> but I think that um, two, two things, I'm, I'm really focused on COVID-19 and the safety of people. I think that that's a temporary concern, much like it was with the bike helmets. But I think that from a 
business perspective, when I think about antiannas or empanadas, or the opportunity to, to bring in a, a potential ice cream shop, which I think Riverside would be perfect for, I, I let's. I, I, I prefer to focus on the existing businesses right now and trying to help them get through this. Selling patty bars versus Nutty Buddies. I think we should take a look at it. I don't know which way I would go on it, but I'd like to see an ordinance on it. So it sounds like we pretty. I mean, it sounds like we all have similar concerns, but that we're at least willing to take a look at an ordinance. And this won't be any time soon. I mean, yeah, we'll sometime later this summer we'll get to it. Okay. Thank you for that. And our last item for discussion tonight is a discussion of a flag display request. Mr. Galagos. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this September marks the anniversary of 9-11, a time in history when all Americans promised to never forget. I am asking our village board to recognize this day and our first responders. They are the brave men and women who ran into the line of fire to save the people at the Pulse nightclub. They are the brave men and women who sheltered thousands as bullets rained down from the Mandalay Hotel in Vegas. They are the brave men and women who protected a Black Lives Matter movement in Dallas, losing five of their finest. They are the brave men and women who ran into the Sandy Hook School to stop a school shooter. They are the brave men and women who stopped an Oregon district mass shooter in seconds. And with images still engraved in many of our minds, they were the first responders when the Twin Towers were attacked. <clears throat> a time again where all Americans promised to never forget. It is for these reasons and countless others, I am asking the village board, my fellow trustees, to fly a flag for first responders for the month of September. That's my statement, but I'd like to add more. <clears throat> Over the last two days, my trustees and I have received a number of emails suggesting that the uh, flag that I suggested, the first responders flag, and likened to the uh, Blue Lives Matter flag, were statements of white supremacy, racism, and bigotry. Uh, I do not find those images to be uh, congruent. And I happen to be a minority. So if anyone has an issue, with those flags, they can take those up with me directly, and I will defend those flags for the true meaning for which they were intended. Having said that, it is only a suggestion that I have. And I'm sure that my fellow trustees have their own thoughts and suggestions, which is why we have discussions. So, Mr. President, let's open that up for discussion. I guess the first thing I would, I would just ask uh, is, is there any, is there anyone who would be in support of one, doing this? One, 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 I mean, I think the, you know, and I've said in responding to emails, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't think that it is um, appropriate to fly any flag or symbol that, that anyone views as, as having a racist connotation. And uh, the rule that I like to live by that, you know, if, if somebody tells you they find something racist, um, you know, you, you accept that as is. Um, but, you know, if there's an alternative flag or some way to show support to our first responders, um, you know, I sort of, when I saw this on the agenda, looked back at, you know, what our first responders were asked to do during the rioting. I mean, that was a spontaneous Sunday. Uh, you know, our, our firefighters, our, our paramedics, our police, you know, rose to the occasion, came up with a plan on the fly to, to close down the streets, and they really do their part to uh, make this, the, the residents of this village, you know, feel extremely safe. Uh, I don't think the flag being proposed, given its uh, co-opting um, by, by hate groups, um, you know, I, I think if, if we are going to send a message in support of first responders, it needs to be a clean message about our first responders. Um, so if there is an alternative flag to be flown, 
um, you know, I think that would be worthwhile. But you know, given sort of the, um, you know, the, the ways that this uh, particular flag or, or similar flags like this have been used in, um, you know, hate marches, I, I don't think that particular flag is appropriate. Manager Francis just reminded me, we do have, we have, I think, two or three public comments that we receive for, uh, not counting Ms. Archer's, right? Sorry? Not counting Ms. Archer? I still can't hear you. Not counting Ms. Archer. How many do we have other than Ms. Archer? Three. Okay. If you could read those three, please. These are, these are comments that people sent in wanting to be read tonight on this issue. So we have an email from Mary Comparta. Uh, good morning. I noticed there was an item flag display Excuse request me, Kathy, on. Can, can everybody hear my <laughs> uh, You're going to have to really try to, if you can. Or you want to give them to me, I, I'll read them. and I can try read them. <laughs> you're going to use your mom voice. Is that <laughs> I, I, I just have a loud voice. I noticed there was a new item, flag display request, on the agenda for Thursday's meeting. Rumor has it that it is regarding flying the red-blue flag, supporting fire and police. The Blue Lives Matter flag has been associated with racism and white supremacy. I do not think we need to fly that flag in Riverside. I am against this. Thank you for your service. I look forward to reading more about this agenda item. Mary Comparita. Next is from... Oh, you're saying the names, right? The names were to be read? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they say they didn't want them. Do I need to scan this real quick? Okay. Lindsay Morrison. Ms. Haley, I appreciate this opportunity su to submit public comment virtually during this pandemic. I hope you and yours are healthy. To the trustees, board, president, and Riverside community, I am writing to express my strong opposition to displaying the flag that has become known as the blue line, red line flag. I'm against any department of the village displaying it at any point, especially in light of the nation's growing awareness of the systemic racial injustice. Most of the nation wants to actively work for justice, including many people here in the community, standing up against injustice and acting to end it. This flag is an intensely divisive symbol at a time when we need unity. Why not this symbol? In spite of its original intention to honor first responders who have died in the line of duty, it is a symbol that has been co-opted by white supremacists. It is used to illustrate hatred of people of color, support of racial injustice. It is used to intimidate people already suffering from unequal treatment, treatment often coming from those sworn to serve and protect all people and people in elected office. This symbol is in direct conflict with the village's welcoming resolution that resolves that the village of Riverside celebrates and encourages diversity and a spirit of inclusion among its residents and visitors and will continue to advance the principles of freedom, equality, and justice for all. Regarding divisiveness in the community of Riverside, the relationship between residents and first responders is primarily positive, even if there may be ways to improve. Flying this flag would be absolutely detrimental to this positive relationship and our ability to work together to strengthen the community. The chief of the Montgomery County, Maryland Department said just last fall that the flag provides a symbol of support to some, but it is a symbol of dismissiveness to others. Because it is divisive, the flag will not be posted in the 5th District nor any public space within the police department. The San Francisco police chief banned the symbol on uniforms, stating that it is divisive and disrespectful to people protesting racial injustice and police brutality. Many first responder departments have policies against officers expressing political opinions while in uniform. This symbol is now a divisive political opinion for much of the county, country. I do not believe that our village government wants to create confrontation and conflict here. Our elected officials and first responders are committed to their job of serving the community. And the community is committed to working with our elected leaders and first responders to make an improvement in the world we live in. Why would we make that harder for all of us? This flag has no place receiving official support from our village government. Thank you, Lindsay Morrison. From Melissa Pleasant. There is a rumor flying that one of the trustees has requested permission to display a Blue Lives Matter flag outside our village hall or in vi village property. I do not think this is appropriate at all and strongly oppose it. Unfortunately, both the Blue Lives Matter movement and or the All Lives Matter movement have become synonymous with hatred and the promotion of racism. 
I do not think that is the message we want to send the community and would be extremely saddened if it was. Additionally, I believe, if memory serves me from my childhood, the ice cream trucks were banned in several municipalities out of concern for children's safety after a string of accidents nationwide involving children in ice cream trucks or children in cars as they ran into the street after the ice cream truck. Something to keep in mind as you debate that issue as well. Regards, Melissa. Thank you. Could I comment? Um, I go back to what Lance said about the chalking that the problem with regulations is when it's content-based. And so this entire discussion to me, I would be in favor of an ordinance that says we fly no flags on our flagpole other than the American flag and the Illinois flag. Because we get into these types of discussion of what does it mean to you, what does it mean to me, I'm offended by it, I'm not offended by it. Um, and so I would propose we have an ordinance that we do not fly flags. Other comments? Mr. Paul. Thank you, President Sells. Um, it's evident from the emails that we've received and the messages we've received from the community that uh, this particular flag, in the court of public opinion at least, is controversial. Uh, and I don't think anyone can deny that, that, that the general public opinion about this particular flag is controversial. It's to some, at the very least, it's ambiguous as to its meaning. And given that, I think our police officers and our firefighters deserve a more unequivocal show of support, one that is unambiguous and that is clear that the community supports them. Um, so in that regard, then I would, I would not be in favor of, of showing our support through the flying of this particular flag. Ms. Evans? Uh, the flag being proposed is derivative of the Blue Lives Matter flag, which is nationally, which has become a national symbol of racism, hatred, and bigotry. So no, I do not wish for the village to fly the flag under any circumstances. Um. I think that Trustee Galagos' intentions were, were, were to support the, the, the first responders. I think that it's been somewhat misconstrued, uh, but I also think that right now with, with things going on in the world, we need to be very careful about what we do and, and, and how we promote things. Um, so I would be open to a alternative you know, we love our first responders, right? Something, something that celebrates them. But I also agree um, with the idea of maybe it should just be the American flag on that flagpole and find an alternative space for people to express their, their voice for, for other initiatives in their, or other things in their lives. Just two cents. I, I, I hadn't thought about that, quite frankly. And, and it was interesting to hear that. I, yeah. It made me reflect. I, I actually think I need more time to think about it. I just think that I don't like getting into discussions of what I approve of. Yeah. yeah. So what I wanted to bring everybody back to is when this whole flag thing started, um, and, and to, to recall this idea of a limited public forum and the fact that you, you can't choose the, what to fly or who to, who to use it based on content. It's also equally true, and this is how you created the flag policy when the rainbow flag was a majority of the board wanted to fly it. Uh, what, what the, the reason you could do that without the, the limited public, creating a limited public forum is that government has the right to speak. And so, for example, when the various military things were going on. You saw uh, the, the Iraq war, uh, municipalities across the country passed, and withdraw US forces from Iraq, or we support our forces. And those were all, that's all speech. That's not regulating what someone else says. It's the elected officials speaking what they think. And so this policy, what Trustee Gallegos presented was presenting it to the board, and that's why it was presented that way. But. The other side of that is when you do express an opinion, you know, you invite a contrary one, and, and so it, it, it is controversial. 
but before the board wanted to get into this a little bit, and now maybe you're rethinking it. I'm certainly not rethinking it. Um, the whole concept of free speech with, from a governmental entity is precisely that. Uh, we speak for the residents. We are elected to be their voice and to portray their values and to speak on their behalf. Uh, in my mind, the rainbow flag and the flag that's being suggested tonight could not possibly be more convergent. Uh, they're not remotely in the same vein. Uh, the provenance of the flag that's being suggested is clear. There is no question that it derives from the flag that is now associated with the Blue Lives Matter movement. That was also no question that that was created in reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement. So there's nothing about this flag that is not divisive. So for that reason, for that part, I think the flag is inappropriate. Going back to the other part, though, however, with regard to our first responders, um, I would just remind everyone that we just had a Fourth of July parade that specifically was designed to allow people to honor our first responders. Uh, we have an annual September 11 remembrance uh, that we do with joint fire and police departments every year. Uh, something that I've been thinking about before this came up with regard to the whole, the, in, in the context of the broader COVID experience, is there actually is a national holiday, uh, a National First Responders Day uh, that was uh, put through Congress by Elizabeth Warren and Tom Cotton of all, let's talk about st strange partners, but they did this, and it's every October 28th. So that would be yet another opportunity where we could have, in, as was mentioned by Mr. Hannon and, and Mr. Pollack, an unambiguous statement about what we're actually talking about. Because I think the respect that we all feel for our, our first responders is pretty much universal within Riverside. Uh, but uh, I think that, that the flying of this flag would actually be a denigration of their service. So I also would oppose it. So it seems to me that there is no support for, for flying this flag. Um, so that, that's the consensus of the board. Those of you who are here uh, are still welcome to speak if you wish, but you've heard what's actually gonna happen. So would anyone like to address us? I need to keep this on while I speak. If, uh, let's see how loudly you can speak. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Audrey Santora. Um, this is a statement written by Simone and Shayla Russell, two twin African-American RB graduates who have been pretty active in the community recently. Hello and good evening. The fact that hanging up the Blue Lives Matter flag is even being considered is an insult to us as black women. It makes us feel unwelcomed in our own community. This flag silences black voices in this town. Institutions always stress how they don't want to be too biased, too political, or choose one side. Yet here we are discussing a flag that was obviously only created to retaliate the Black Lives Matter movement. The Blue Lives Matter flag was created in 2014, but the United States has had police departments since 1845. Why do people feel the need to honor cops now? They've been around for a while. This flag is clearly an attempt to cover up systemic racism and police brutality. Only when the attention is on black people do people say things, but what about everyone else? On the 4th of July, no one says, but all countries matter. On Veterans Day, no one says, but all Americans matter. On Father's Day, no one says, but mothers matter too. Unlike the Black Lives Matter movement, with these examples, the general public does not try to invalidate them by mentioning or including another group of people. Right now, and since the beginning of time, it is undeniable that black people and other minorities are failed, targeted, and wronged by this country and its systems. Even if you don't mean to be racist by flying this flag, you have to admit and address that this flag has had racially charged motivations and supporters with the sole intent to tear down the Black Lives Matter movement. 
If you truly claim this is just an act to honor the police and not disrespect the min minorities in this community, then you should simultaneously fly the Black Lives Matter flag along with other representative flags for minorities. You can't blame us for getting riled up about this since this is a predominantly white town and we as minorities already feel left out in many ways. It is rare of this town to celebrate minorities and stress the fact that they care about us. So imagine how after all of this, it would feel to us if you hang up this flag. If we didn't feel welcomed before, we definitely would not feel welcome now. If you don't understand anything else, at the very least, you should understand that the timing of this call to fly the Blue Lives Matter flag is inappropriate, insensitive, distasteful, and implies that it is racially motivated. If you truly believe that all lives matter, then you would take the time to understand the black individuals in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Can you, uh, can you do the sanitizing up here? Thank you. Hello, my name is Aaron Palmer. Uh, uh, personally, I'm a person of color. My dad is black, my mother is white. I'm a mixed human being, I guess. Uh, this is a statement my brother has written. He is also mixed. He's a senior at Western Illinois, studying politics and marketing. Flying the Blue Lives Matter flag will make black people feel unwelcome in their own community. Whether you reform something slightly does not mean you change the underlying message. To people of color, this flag represents hatred and ignorance of their own experiences in life. To many, seeing this flag waved is no different than seeing the Confederate flag, a sign of hatred and oppression. The Blue Lives Matter movement is a movement based on the belief that, that police and dealing with are dealing with an increasingly unsafe job. In 2014, after NYPD officers Rafael Ramos and Wajian Lu were killed, Joe and Patrice and other former active officers began the movement, began this movement. They make it clear in the history section of their website that the lives of Officer Ramos and Lu are not the main reason they started this movement. Instead, they chose to focus on, in the history section, the Black Lives Matter movement and the media as a motivating factors for the creation of this group. The first thing in their history is discussing the murder of Michael Brown. Michael Brown was a black 18 year old who, defending himself as a policeman grabbed him from inside a car, a police car, grabbed the gun, which was being pointed at him, and then attempted to run, not with the gun, but attempted to run, and when shots were fired at him fleeing, he turned around with his hands up and was murdered. Even ignoring the fact the flag was flown by white supremacists during the Charlottesville protest, it is not hard to see why black and indigenous people and other people of color feel uncomfortable seeing this flag in their own neighborhood. Black Lives Matter was started after George Zimmerman was found not guilty of murdering Trayvon Martin. Alicia Garza, Patrice Couillers, and Opal Tometi knew that the United States was silent whenever justice was needed for black people. Blue Lives Matter claims the same thing is happening to them. According to the FBI in 2016, 66 officers were killed deliberately while doing their job compared to the 1,093 people they killed the same year. 215 were black. By publicly supporting the Blue Lives Matter movement, Riverside would not be supporting police officers, but instead supporting misinformation and making its own citizens feel uncomfortable and unwelcome. By flying this flag that represents this movement, Riverside is choosing to ignore the experience of black people everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello everyone, can you guys hear me? Okay, um, well, I'm Devin. I've been working with these fabulous people for the Black Lives Matter thing. 
And one thing, can I like take this off? I can't really breathe. Um, <clears throat> to me, as a black person in this whole town, seeing this whole board meeting and go through, I know Mr. Uh, G over there loves to police. I not gonna like argue like that's his opinion and we have different opinions and we have to respect that but we can't have this like you know mob mentality where everybody should attack him and attack his family for what he does and you know we have to come together and find a you know an argument has two sides you got a positive you got a negative at the end of the day you need to find an equilibrium and the whole argument so what's for example if i was a black family who lost tons and tons of you know family members to the police and I saw that flying in my village how would I feel well a person of not colored or of somebody else would be like oh well they're just supporting the police and everything but I would have a different opinion where I'm just like yo my family got killed by these people like I, I, I don't like really mess with these people like they killed my family and my brothers and sisters and how we could celebrate like what you guys said. We got separate days, 9-11. We got Veterans Day. We got every 4th of July. We got every other day to celebrate police and everything else. I just personally, excuse my language, but it's a big F you to like fly to flag at this moment in time of history. Like it's just like we're protesting and then you get to fly that up there. It's going to make you, you think like you're going to like calm it down, but you're just making people go up and up where you're gonna get like more Karens than you really want. So you want to work with the minorities of this town and the towns around them to hear what they have to say before we cause something, a bigger problem that we don't want. And see, hearing me from this else, some people say I'm not black enough to you know talk about the situation. I grew up privileged and I have some family members who aren't privileged like I am. I'm I'm lucky to go to RB, went to RB. I'm lucky to have great, you know, I have a great job. I'm a Riverside caddy. Um, I'm just lucky to be privileged. But to see my brothers and sisters struggle, like where my aunt, when she first came in this town from Texas, she was scared because our neighbors were just looking at her funny because they didn't know who she was, but they were like following her. And then one thing that really ticked me off was one of my neighbors said, so my mom and I were out in the garden and we're helping my white father, stepdad, and they said, oh, do you live here? And my mother stood up and she's like, excuse me, we've been living here for five years, 271 South Coat Road, ma'am. And she's like, oh, I thought you were just helping him. See, that's where we got to draw the line of there needs to be more raisins in the suns and with the whole cop situation, I think the cops need to have implicit bias training. It's not just cops are killing black people, they're killing everybody. And um, we need to work, like I said, we need to work together to solve this issue so we don't take two steps forward and then go two steps back and we're just back at square one. We don't need that. We need to go forward as a community and then later down the years, I could say I'm proud to raise kids in this lovely community instead of oh, I leave this community because this community is filled of hatred or just neglect, and I don't want that for anybody else. I love this community with my heart. I just have some issues, but I feel like, you know, humans make mistakes, and we could clean up our mistakes. They said Generation Z is the generation to change everything, you know? Someone's going out there saying something really blatant offensive, just, you know, just correct them. It's simple like that. That's all I gotta say, I'm just saying, we could work this together, uh, um, you know, a house div divided by itself cannot stand, and pretty much a country divided by itself cannot stand at all. We need to be unified. We are the United States of America, the land of opportunities. We are not the communist regime of China. We're not just all the same. We are different, but we need to come together and be one. So uh, actually, I'm glad Devin just said that because he reminded me that I did have something else in my president's report that I forgot to mention. Uh, so we had mentioned, I had mentioned uh, a few weeks ago that we were going to be putting together uh, an extended conversation about policing in, in Riverside. Uh, that is going to take place on August the 6th. It's a community conversation on policing in Riverside. It's going to be a panel 
uh, that comprises uh, our Chief of Police, Tom Weitzel, our Deputy T Chief, Bill Kutchik, and our Lieutenant, Frank Lara. Uh, I will be the moderator of the event. We're going to ask people, because of the COVID concerns, we're going to ask people to send in questions ahead of time. There will, of course, be an opportunity at the conversation to ask questions at that time. But we're going to try to, if there are common questions, we'd like to get those answered up first so that we can have more time for a, a broader ranging discussion uh, with our command staff from our police department. So the August 6th, it's basically it's in lieu of our village board meeting. So that will allow the trustees then to, to attend uh, also. So it'll be at seven o'clock uh, in this room on August 6th, conversation, community conversation on policing in Riverside. So uh, with that, is there any new business? So yes, just please. Make, make a comment. Um, you know, I, I, I again applaud the young people for coming out here and, and, and raising awareness. Um, you know, I, I would suggest that the history lesson, you know, go back uh, a little farther. Uh, my father was very active in, in community banking on the south side. Um, you know, I'm proud to say that he went down to uh, Rainbow Bush, Rainbow Push Coalition meeting uh, and, and spoke alongside Reverend Jesse Jackson on uh, community banking, removal of redlining. So I want to give that background uh, on these statements. You know, to, to be upset that somebody raised an issue or raised a uh, proposal at a village board, I, I don't think it's fair to attack that. That's the whole reason why we have a village board meeting. We're a deliberative body. We have an open and transparent form of government. Um, you know, what was raised here as a way to support the police during the course of the discussion, during the course of public comment, during the course of the, of the uh, emails we received, it was apparent that that flag was not appropriate. Um, and I think when you listen to this village board meeting, you see that that's the consensus we came to. So, you know, I think as people look back at what we did, uh, it's not appropriate to say the village is trying to fly this flag. The village had a discussion on this flag and the village at the board had a thoughtful discussion on this flag is not appropriate because of the uh, various uses that it's had. You know, we can debate its intent, where it originally came from, but the fact is it's been co-opted and it's now not a pure symbol, so it's not appropriate to do. But please appreciate the deliberative body that we have and what we do, and merely because something is proposed doesn't mean that there's a sinister agenda behind this. Under the Opens Meeting Act, this is the only time that the trustees can get together to discuss these issues, to discuss proposals in the same way you saw with the ice cream truck, in the same thing you saw with the pride flag several months ago. This is where we have the discussion. And so I don't want anyone walking away. I'm offended that this issue came up. If issues didn't come up, if no one was willing to push the boundaries, if no one was willing to come out and say, I want to fly the pride flag, notwithstanding two years before I suggested this, there was a movement to take it down. We'd never have change. So, you know, I think it's important that we continue to be deliberative, that all the trustees not be afraid to propose an idea, and that you realize that this body is to discuss ideas and to come conclusions, and tonight we came to the right conclusion. So please keep that in mind um, as you reflect back on what we did today. Ms. Evans. Um, I understand what Trustee Hannon is saying. I also would like to just say, as a trustee, I feel a sense of responsibility prior to bringing something to the board um, as far as researching you know, what it is that I want to propose. Um, it, could it be a harmful idea? Could it be harmful just having it on the agenda to discuss? Um, I do think we have a responsibility of doing a little bit of research before putting it out, you know, on the agenda. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, every conversation doesn't have to start at the board meeting. Any new business for this evening? Hearing none, we do not have a need for an executive session, so I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. Uh, motion by Mr. Gallagher. Second. Second by Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Jisa. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. 
Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion passes, meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night. Jack.